Hey, good day. <clears throat> okay, how so eloquently said, in God we trust, all others bring data. So I'm here to bring data. Um, and my goal is, okay, the, uh, it's been said that it doesn't matter what the Pope or the Church thinks about climate change and global warming, how much is going on. But I would actually beg to differ because it does matter because if the church thinks there is a problem present in terms of climate change or global warming, then they're presented with a moral dilemma of choosing between the destruction of the earth or perhaps some unsavory and destructive policies. But if there is no potential problem with climate change, that dilemma is removed and it makes all decisions a lot simpler, moral decisions much simpler because of that, and much easier to make the correct moral decision. Okay, I'm a scientist. I've been in climate change biz 60 years. I may not look that old, but it's true. Back when I was a kid in the 1950s, there was a state of hurricanes on the east coast of the U.S., and I got fascinated by the subject. And at that time, a lot of these hurricanes were attributed to Guess what? Humans in the form of nuclear testing in the atmosphere. And somehow, these atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere were affecting the path and generation of hurricanes. Well, there's been the, new, the atmosphere test ban treaty a few years later, but guess what? We still have hurricanes. Nothing has changed. And I don't think anybody thinks that these nuclear tests now caused any of those hurricanes. Well, we have a similar issue now, and in the 60 years I've been in climate change, I've seen several changes of climate. In the 1960s, the climate of the East Coast of the U.S. shifted to colder and there was bigger snowstorms, and then these ceased later in the 1980s. I've seen several cycles. I've been around long enough to see several cycles in the atmosphere, and we are indeed going through another one. Okay, so for the data, actually, may, does everybody have a copy of this? Showing the ground. Yeah. And I'll definitely go into more detail tomorrow. You know, I got more data, more slides, you know, numerical analyses and all that. But I could say that one says it all. It's an excellent slide. It makes the point that in the past 18 years and how many months, four months, there's been no global warming. But of course the Earth has been around longer than that. And the truth is, there has been some warming over the past 30 years. So my goal is to determine how much is there, what has caused it, and that is very important because once you pin down what has caused it or what has limited its causes, then you can make a projection into the future and come up with a number. A simple number saying, this is how big the problem is. And is this problem worth dealing with or worth correcting? Okay, so on this graph, again, I'll hold up the chart here. It shows that the bulk of the models have a warming of a bit over one degree, one and a half degrees Celsius over about a 50 year period. Now this chart does extend into the future. Keep that in mind. Okay, but the real world at the bottom shows a trend of about three tenths of a degree over 50 years. So the 30 or so years of data you're talking, less than one fourth of a degree Celsius of overall warming of the atmosphere as measured by satellite, which is the best and only truly global data. And if we're talking about global warming, you need global data. Taking weather stations in Ascension Island and another one in Tahiti in average to get, or and a tree in Siberia, to get a global average doesn't quite cut it. That's not a global average. You know, most of the world is not sampled by weather stations. But there are global average temperatures since 1979. So we have this quarter of a degree warming since 1979. The models have projected roughly three times that amount. What can we attribute the warming that has occurred to? And some of the data I'll be able to show tomorrow, I think pretty clearly demonstrates 
that about half of it is due to events in the 1980s and 1990s, namely two large volcanic eruptions, El Chichon in Mexico and Pinatubo in the Philippines, and especially Pinatubo. And they suppressed the temperatures during this 15-year period from, say, 1980 to 1995 by putting a haze layer in the atmosphere that reduced the amount of sunlight that reached the ground, causing a net cooling of a tenth or two-tenths of a degree. So if you cool the beginning of the period, the end of the period is relatively warmer. That introduces an upward trend. And my conclusion would be that half of this warming of a quarter of a degree over the past 34, 35 years is due to the volcanoes early in the period, and there haven't been any since 1991, so the Earth is heated up a bit because of that. And a bit of the other half is due to carbon dioxide. So the conclusion then would be that carbon dioxide is responsible for one-tenth of one degree of warming over 30 years. So extrapolate that to the end of this century, roughly nine years, 85 years. That gives you another three-tenths of a degree. And I would call that an upper limit to what's going to happen due to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increasing at current rates and every indication is it is increasing at current rates not speeding up not really slowing down just sort of going on its merry way to 500 parts per million around the year 2100 so is two tenths of a degree a problem i don't think so you'd have a hard time measuring it you know, go outside with a thermometer and then warm it up two tenths of a degree. You know, really, it's not going to affect your lifestyle. It's not going to affect agricultural productivity. It's not really going to affect anything. So, global warming due to carbon dioxide is a minuscule problem. And I think because of that, people who are forced with a moral dilemma of choosing between this dangerous situation developing and possibly more dangerous policies to combat it, don't really have to worry about that because this dangerous situation is not developing. So it becomes a non-issue. So that's why I think the science is, you know, is important because it can give us a number. Now, of course, you have the issue, why does the IPCC stick to these much larger warming trends? Well, they spent billions of dollars to come up with these beautiful models. They're very complex, they're very elegant. A lot of research has gone into them, and very good research where they go out and investigate clouds and investigate circulation patterns in the atmosphere, ocean currents, and volcanoes and interactions with carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. A lot of work has gone into it, but something is wrong, something is missing, and they're having a hard time dealing with that fact. So I will read a couple of quotes from some very interesting scientists over the eons here that relate to this. Okay, one of them has been quoted before, that's Richard Feynman physics professor, where was he? Columbia, I believe. Cal. 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 Okay. It was fun side of the country. Okay. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And the models are wrong. Well, what to do about that? Well, you can actually learn from being wrong. And here's another quote. It's about Johannes Kepler by Carl Sagan in a very elegant TV episode he did for Cosmos called The Harmony of the Worlds about the life and times of Johannes Kepler, who is a pivotal science scientist in the history of humanity. So, this is Sagan talking about Kepler. When Johannes Kepler found that his long-cherished beliefs did not agree with the most precise observations, 
He accepted the uncomfortable facts. He preferred the hard truth to his dearest delusions. That is the heart of science. And so I think the IPCC would be well behooved to take note of this. That is the heart of science. They can learn from this and improve their models and come up with a model that's useful. My, my extrapolation is not really a model, it's a simple fitting a straight line onto the observed data. There's really no great intelligence behind that, but it does tell you that these models are ineffective, you cannot use them. So, I guess I will close with a you know, quote from myself, <laughs> which is not, not usually the best one. You know, I think draconian measures to solve this 0.2 degree warming is like using surgery to solve a sniffle. You know, and it's bad on two counts. One, the cure is worse than the ailment. Number two, the cure doesn't even fix the ailment. So, why bother? So, you know, a bumper sticker would be all these draconian policies that could introduce world poverty, especially to the already poor, would be flawed, flawed policies that will fail to solve a non-existent problem. Okay, thank you.